Praise the Lord. Good evening. Thank God we can come hear the word tonight. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege and honor to be able to come in fellowship and presence and hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's read some divine healing scriptures. We can all use those. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 53. Now, the scripture says here, we'll read here in verse 4, to five, four, and four excuse me, just verse 4 and 5. Someone says, hey, Brother Rich, I feel pretty good tonight. That's all right. You want to stay that way. And you're going to do that with God's word. Okay, here in Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5 says, Surely borne our griefs, that's also translated sickness, and carried our sorrows, and that's also translated pains. I like to read this way. Surely borne my griefs and carried my sorrows, pains, sickness and pains. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastised our peace upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now let's jump over here to the book of Matthew. Matthew's going to refer to this, and the Holy Spirit's going to use him. In Matthew chapter 8, now verse 16 and 17 says here, When evening was come, they brought unto him, Jesus, many was possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled, fulfilled which spoke by Isaiah the prophet, we just read there, saying himself, took our infirmities, and bare our sicknesses. Now, please, let's go over here to the book of 1 Peter. Again, like you're heading towards the book of Revelation. In 1 Peter chapter 2, now the scripture says here in verse 24, uh, who his own self bear our sins, his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unrighteous by whose stripes you were healed. Now this shows us here in the past tense, and that's what we really want to focus on, that this has already been accomplished, that Jesus not only took our sins, but he took our sickness and diseases. You know, our, when we became, when we received Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, the Bible says we became a new creature in Christ Jesus. So we didn't get our sins healed. They were blotted out. And God doesn't even remember what we did. Thank God for that. What Jesus did, he also took our sick diseases. And we didn't know, realize that and build ourselves up. One of the problems is that most of us that grew up in church always heard God doesn't always heal. Or God gets glory out of being sick, or healing passed away, or God raised up doctors to take the place of divine healing. Or if you do pray for healing, you should pray if it be thy will. But that's not right. You know, it's crazy because Jesus already, we wouldn't pray that way with, with a sinner to receive Jesus. We wouldn't say, well, you know, salvation's passed away. God doesn't always save. If you do pray for Jesus, receive Jesus, you should pray if it be thy will. But most people say, you know, it's born again. Well, certainly not. Well, then don't do anything like that for healing. You know, what we many of us had to unlearn when we came to Jesus about divine healing because we heard God doesn't always heal or something like that in church, you know. Well, this here says here that it's already been done. The by whose stripes you were healed. Worst past tense, heals past tense. Now here in 2 Peter chapter 1, now notice here uh, in verse, I'll well, start in verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Now verse 3. According as his divine power hath, we say has, right? Hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these, these exceedingly precious promises, we might be partakers of, of, his, of the divine in nature, having escaped the corruption that's in this world through lust. And then keep going like heading towards Revelation. And here in 3 John, verse 2 says here, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper, and be in health, is thy soul prosper. Now this is God's will for every believer, to prosper financially, and have good health physically, and also have a sound mind, our emotions, our soul, our intellect. And we need to believe God on all these areas. And we're going to do that with God's promises. God doesn't want anybody poor. He doesn't want anybody sick. He doesn't want anybody broke or financially devastated. And definitely he doesn't want anybody you know, that stay unsaved or stay as a sinner. No, he wants everybody to receive Jesus Christ the Lord. I mean, every born-again Christian that's heard John, John 3, 16, believes it's God's will that everybody be saved. I mean, I never heard a born-again preacher preach against him. I pray God I don't ever hear one. But anyway, no, it's God's will that everybody receive Jesus Christ the Lord. Well, 3 John is to the world. It's God's will that every person in the world become born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that who shall believe him shall not perish but have lasting life. But once you get born again, you don't keep hearing that verse. You're already born again. You know, so often sin Christians have been preached to in church like they were sinners. You know, always, you know, bringing up sin and bringing up, you know, we got to stay close to God. Rapture takes place. We may be left behind. Well, that's not security. We, you know, God gave us through Jesus eternal life, everlasting life, not, not conditional salvation. It's not based on our performance. It's based on what Jesus did, that he's the one that finished it. He's the one that paid the price. 
You remember there in John 19, verse 30, Jesus, just before he gave up the ghost, said it's finished. He paid the salvation price for all mankind. And Jesus took the curse upon him. But the thing is, we weren't taught that. Now, most of us had a Bible. We could have read it. But, you know, most of us grew up as Catholic and Protestant. We never read the Bible and didn't know you were supposed to. But nevertheless, we need to realize that God, through here, over in 3 John now, this is God's will for each believer. That they prosper financially, have good health physically. I mean, that's what God wants us to have, as it is in heaven, so it be in this earth. Jesus came, we might have life and have more abundantly. And it's God that worships above all things that we prosper. And he wants us to he know that he's already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You know, the 23rd Psalm says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That means I shall not want for ability, I shall not want for money, I shall not want for health, I shall not want for wisdom, I shall not want an air near of my life, because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And knowing promises helps us stay encouraged in God's word. Everybody has challenges, but promises let us know what God's will is for our life. And we always need to always go back to promises. Again, every Christian has an idea about what God's will is for their life and other people's lives. But what God's will is for each person's life is what he promised us. What he promised us is what belongs to us. What he purchased and gave to us is what he wants us to have. And what he say? Well, he wants us to have, receive all the Father has. And we can do that by knowing that what Jesus bought and paid for and freely gave to us. And taking God's promises and building our life upon it, you know. And every day, you know, do you want to watch what you listen to? Watch what kind of preachers you listen to. Because it's real easy to hear something, you know, God's going to do it someday. This is something we have to realize he's already done. He's already given us all things pertaining to life and Godness. We're not trying to get this. We're not waiting for God to save someone. He's already paid the salvation price. Our job as believers, the church, is take the gospel out and let people know that Jesus has already done this for us. That God's not imputing the, uh, the world's sins. He put that all upon Jesus. That God's not going to judge America or some country because of sin. Now, a lot of people like for him to. You know, they just, they just want... But it, first of all, everybody's always sinned anyway. So there's not more sin going on than there was. It may get more publicized, but nevertheless, there's always been plenty of sin here. But grace much more abounds where sin abounds. And thank God we need to focus on the grace of God, not the sins that's in the world. And God's not imputing man's sins. He put them upon Jesus. Well, all the person has to do is receive Jesus Christ as Lord. And when they do, they become a child of God. They become a new creature in Christ Jesus. They don't get overhauled. They become brand new. And in that covenant we have, one of the benefits is prosperity. Financial prosperity. We know for, that we're an heir of Abraham's blessing. And that was material. It was God that made Abraham very rich. Not just rich, very rich. And thank God, that's what God wants us to have. Because he supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Not according to the economy. Not according to the world's goods. It's all based on what God did through Jesus Christ. And God wants every person to have abundance, and there's plenty for every person to have an abundance. It starts out with the mentality knowing that God wants you to have abundance. There's nothing wrong with the things of the world. There's nothing wrong with money. It's the person's heart that has it. If the heart's messed up, you know, with the wrong motives, then whatever they do, it's going to be wrong anyway. But if a person's born again, the Spirit of God dwells inside of them. They don't have an evil heart. They're brand new creatures in Christ Jesus, you know. We, ha we have just have to realize that, you know, all the money in the world isn't going to change us. I mean, it's not changing me. I'm still serving God. And I think I've proven that. But anyway, we need to realize that, that all these blessings belong to us. And we need to know that the God wants us to have them. And he taught us in his word that he would teach us to prosper. To profit. That means prosper. He wants whatever we put our hand to to prosper. We're blessed. So what we touch is blessed. And we're blessing wherever we go. We've already been blessed. Everything the Father has has been given to us. But there's always been this, you know, controversy and fight against prosperity in, in the church and divine healing. And so people got intimidated. Many dear Christians, born again people, got intimidated about believing God for healing or believing God for prosperity because they heard some, you know, some preacher preach against it. Well, thank God for the preacher. Maybe they know something about salvation, the new birth. But that doesn't mean they know what they're talking about when it comes to divine healing. Most ministers should not be allowed to visit the sick because these people came and saw me when I was sick all those months there, you know. 
go, went to hospital one year and came out the next year? Well, you know, they come in and no one knew anything about praying to prayer of faith. So they just come in and, and I, I guess try to console you. You know, you're, I'm, you're, I'm circling the drain and they know you're, you can tell by looking at you, you're going to go anytime. Well, you know, that, and then they'd be able to tell people, hey, I went and saw him. Yeah, did you go see Jesse? Yeah, I stopped by because, you know, they'd ask their minister, priest, whoever, please go see him. Well, thank God, you know, but, you know, they, they could have just brightened up the room by leaving it. It, it's, it was a courtesy visitation. And you know something? People know that, too. I mean, I was 18 years old and knew that, that this is just a courtesy visit. So sometimes I just act like I was asleep or unconscious when people came, like the principal, the vice principal, and people like that. I knew they didn't care. I mean, God bless them. I'm not holding this against them. You know, you don't care, you don't care. And you, people carry that with you, when, with them. You either, when you come in a room, you bring a spirit of faith or you bring some other kind of spirit. And there is a spirit of faith. And you know what? You want to catch it. And you want to have it with you wherever you go. And when you come in, Jesus just walked in the room because he dwells inside of each believer. It's nothing we did. He says, all I did. He's the one that wanted to dwell inside of us by the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he's in the world. So when that person comes in, they bring something with them. They bring the power of God. They bring faith with them, the spirit of faith. You know, years ago before Oral Roberts uh, built the city of faith, he had a man that worked for him for years, I don't know, about 35 years, Dave uh, Bob DeWeese. And so it was this crusade director, and he went into Saul Roberts, man, God's man of faith and power. And he dinners his Saul Roberts. Well, did this for years, and he ran, you know, pretty well ran his ministry for him. Well, Bob DeWeese, DeWeese um, had got stricken with a heart attack, rushed him to the hospital, and I think his wife called, got a hold of Oral and said, would you come in and see him? Well, so Earl goes to visit Bob DeWeese in the hospital, and he's unconscious. And old Roberts goes in to see him. And uh, there was a few doctors and nurses around. And, you know, they were just, you know, sad to say, but very cynical. And plus, they, you know, what they think of old Roberts, you know, he's some kind of charlatan. And so old Roberts comes walking in the room. And I've had to pray with people before when I had that in the room. Nurses and doctors, you know. You know, it's great you're a doctor and nurse, but you don't have to be cynical about miracles. You know, because some people are whatever you think there are charlatans or making up stuff, you know, doesn't mean the rest of us are. I know I'm not. I know me. So I live with me. So I know how I am. So, you know, he comes into the room. And so he, I think, laid his hands on him, you know. And of course, you can imagine this guy's wife. She's standing there. She wants him raised up out of this bed. And Oral Roberts prayed a polite prayer and greeted the people and everything and left the room. And so he was walking down the hallway, and he got to the elevator. And just as he went to push his, his finger on the button for the elevator, some hand grabbed him. And he looked down, it was a little girl. It was Bob De DeWeese's granddaughter, I believe. She said, Brother Roberts. You didn't pray a tent prayer. Now, there was a person with Oral Roberts, and he didn't understand what this little girl's even talking about. But Oral Roberts knew. He said, honey, you're right, I didn't. And he went back in the room with his tent prayer. And when he walked in that time, we got a different person. And he commanded Satan, let go of this man. I break Satan's power of darkness and death over this man. Pray to prayer like that. And Bob DeWeese came, you know, got healed. He got, you know... And lived to go on to be a blessing. Well, what was the difference? One was a religious prayer. And the little girl knew it. Because she'd been in his 10 meetings. And she knew there was a difference between a polite prayer and a faith prayer. You know, the sad thing is, most Christians don't know the difference. You know, once you hear the phony and you hear the real thing, Nothing takes place the real thing. Now, I may eat some ravioli from Chef Boyardee out of a can, heat it up in the microwave, but I never think I'm eating Italian food. There's a difference. And there's a difference in the prayer of faith and a religious prayer. And if you don't know the difference, you need to learn the difference.
One of them's got power. One of them hits the throne of God. One of them's coming in the name of Jesus, and they're not messing around. Or Robert said the Lord goes right. I didn't pray the power of God like I used, like I always prayed, get people healed and delivered. And see, people can be very cynical about divine healing. And even family members can be very cynical about someone's believing God for healing or believing God's for God's promises. You got to love everybody, but you just have to realize this way some people are. You know, pray to God they change. They get old, but everybody, everybody is going to need a miracle. And everybody is going to need to know how to get hold of God's power. Every single person. There's not a one person. I learned that on 9 11, living in Manhattan. All those people that I rode the elevator with they were celebrities, you know, billionaire people and everything else. I had people, I'm not going to tell you, but anyway, everybody needs Jesus and everybody needs a miracle. And the sooner we learn how to get a hold of them, the more results we can get for ourselves and other people. And there is a difference between Christian, Christian religion and the spirit of faith. And you want to know the difference. And so often people just paid some kind of, you know, polite prayer with no power. No, Jesus gave us power. He said, behold, I give you power. Trump on surface, corpus, all the power of the enemy, and nothing's going to hurt you. And so God gave us this power in the name of Jesus and with authority of the believer. And we, use, we have to use that authority if we're going to get results. And you talk to the devil, you mean business. You speak with authority, you say what you mean, and mean what you say. And you take authority of him in the name of Jesus. You decree and declare what God's word says. And keep God's word in you every day. Speak God's word out your mouth. Listen to God's word come into your ears. See it with your eyes. And fill your heart with the power of God. And keep getting yourself filled with God's word. Many people came and saw me. When I was in the hospital for those months. And they brought, you know, maybe they were meant to be kind. But I learned something from it when I did get it released. You know what? Don't do this just out of being polite. Mean it when you go. So often people visit the sick just to appease their own conscience. So they can say, well, at least I went and saw him. You know, it's be better if you probably just stayed at home. Unless you're going to come in there and encourage that person and get them all jacked up with God's word instead of just in a social call but coming in and really meaning it, you probably want to think about this. Because not... You know, people p can pick up on what, what happens. And they know if a person's got it or not. And I'll tell you, guarantee the devil knows if a person's got it or not. He knows. He said, Paul, I, they may said, come out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the devil spoke up and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? He knows the difference. You can't fake him out. He's, he's got more experience than you and I do. He's been around a lot longer. So he's seen it all. So we come, we come in the name of Jesus. We use the authority that God gave us. And we get ourselves built up. But don't ever think the people that maybe I wasn't saved don't know the difference. Because people can come in a service when someone's anointed and they, got, they realize this person's got something. And the Holy Spirit knows every person in that congregation, everybody that's in that meeting, and he'll have that preacher, if they'll be led by the Spirit of God, anointed by the Spirit of God, to maybe just go off on some area and then come right back to where they were at. Because there was some there that someone needed to, to, to know something there. It's where, like, where the Holy Spirit begins to read people's mail. That's what the anointing will do. How God anointed Jesus and Nazareth to go some power, who went about doing good and healing all that oppressed the devil, for God was with him. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So from his body I brought the sick handkerchiefs and aprons, and disease power from them. Evil spirits went out on them. It's the anointing. It's the call of God that's on that minister's life. A lot of people go in the ministry for various reasons. You have to be called. If you're called, he'll anoint you to do what you're supposed to be doing. And the gifts and calling without repentance. You'll stand before the Lord. If you did, I, did you do what I told you to do? He wants every minister to do what he told them to do, to preach what he told them to preach. Of course, we all preach the word. I got that. But there's a big difference. And just going into ministry is a vocation. And many theologians did that, you know. But we're never called. There's a calling. 
Some are apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. That means there's not many. And if you're called, he'll anoint you. And Jesus didn't minister publicly until he became anointed. And said, with the, that's when he said, the Spirit of the Lord is bombing me because he's known me to preach the gospel for him. So he went with that anointing. And when he preached, they said his words had power. They didn't say that about other people. It didn't mean he was, you know, he was hitting them with his words, but his words had power. His words changed the difference, made the difference. And it makes a big difference, you know. But so often people listen to some minister who was never called to God, and they never was around anointing. And so they don't know there's a difference. They just think, well, all ministers are all the same, but they're not. You know, there's some specialist even in the ministry. Thank God for that. But there's a big difference between Christian religion and the anointing of God. And to be ordained, used to in a church, to get for a person to become ordained, they, the congregation would have him preach. And if they saw that person suddenly became anointed and they went from just a regular guy that they knew, a deacon or elder, or whatever you call him, or just a regular Christian. And if they could see that person suddenly change and have the anointing upon them, the power of God, they would ordain them. And that's the only way you used to get ordained. But a lot of that changed, you know, and we got away from the anointing. No, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's the anointing that makes the difference. The anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's just different degrees of it. It can be stronger or less. And you can increase it by preparation, by praying as a minister. And we need to know that as believers. That focus in, if you're called to God, focus on what you're supposed to do. You're going to have a lot of opportunities to do a lot of things as a preacher. But what did God call you to do? Focus on that. Be faithful to that. That's what you give an account for. There's a lot of things you can do in the ministry, but you're going to get rewarded for it if it wasn't God's will. You know? He'll take care of you when well, anything bad happened to you, but it's what he told us to do. Whatever he told that minister to do, it's what they're supposed to do. And every believer, as far as that goes. And, you know, a minister is not more anything. They just have more responsibility if they're a preacher. They're, they got more work to do than just a Christian, a born-again Christian. But we all have to use our authority in Jesus' name. There's no one has more access to God than you do you got to come to him the same way anybody else has to come in Jesus' name. And thank God for that, you know. If someone told me to, some guy, you know, I don't know if he's even saved or not, but said, you know, hey, you know, say a prayer for me. I said, no. God hears you as much as he hears me because I, I, I don't have any special access to him. We all have to use the name of Jesus. And that's what gets us access to God. It's Jesus, what Jesus did. And Jesus wants every person to receive healing. He would have never, ever went through that. They ripped his back off. You could see his bones. This is what he did for the church, for the world. And the church hasn't known that. In Psalm 22 and Psalm 129, it shows us in Isaiah 52 how bad Jesus was beaten. And he did this before he went to the cross. It does make a difference what we've been taught. And many of us had to unlearn. When we heard 1 Peter 2, 24, I mean, we never heard something like that before. We always heard God could heal. If we did get any healing scriptures, people told us it didn't mean healing. It meant something else, you know, some kind of whatever they'd come up with. But no, it means physical healing. Look how many times Jesus healed people physically. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How could you think it meant something else? When you get born again, you don't get, you know, spiritually healed you become a brand new creature in christ jesus and there is physical healing emotional healing where people are messed up mentally and those things come to all of us folks so don't ever think you know just that person's whacked out because of something no that that demon comes to everybody so that's why you and i stay strong saying i have the mind of christ we watch what we say about our mind and our brain we say we have the mind of christ my memory is blessed in jesus name we don't use the word forget when, you know, when goofing around about things, you know. No, we're serious. I mean, we forget our sins. That's what we're supposed to forget. But we're very careful about what we say about our mind. Because we always want our mind protected in Jesus' name. And like the psalmist said in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget all his benefits. He doesn't want us to forget. And we need to be real careful about that. About using the word forget. We guard that. You know, there's a different way we can word it. Or just don't say nothing, you know. 
this, you, we're believing God to find our keys to our car. You know, we don't have to go around and say ten, ten, 10 times or one time, I forget where I put them. We need to listen and, you know, not make a big deal of it. The Lord will bring it to us. He'll show us to get you and I calm down. So we read there in 3 John that God wishes above all things to be prosper. That means financially. God doesn't care how much money you got, what you got. You're not going to press him. You know, as you're born again, you have the Spirit of God inside of you, you're not going to backslide over it. You know, because you realize where it came from. You know, it didn't come from you. You know, <laughs> you know we all tried that way. No, no, you realize, you know, this is how many times, how many, how many, every job you got, right? Who's the first thing you thought about who did it for you? You told people that God got you this job. See, it didn't affect you. It's, you got this new car. You got a new boat. You got a second house. You, who would you tell people? What you tell? What they ask you? It was the Lord. He worked it all out. In fact, you know, I'm not too sure how he even did it. That's how we talk because we're believers. We don't lose sight of who got this for us. We give God a credit about everything. If someone compliments us, we just say it's the Lord. You know, and and our and we mean when we say it's the Lord, what He did for me, He'll do for you. Not that I'm special Christian. This is why God did this. This is I just says by the grace and mercy of God. If there's anything good I have, it's definitely God, Jesus. There's no one else can get the credit. Just by God's mercy and grace, I'm here today, and every day. You know, I mean, on, on, since that day, you know, no. So we always give God the credit. When do we ever take the credit for anything? We will take the credit for our faults, and we got to be careful about that. But. You know, no, we always tell people there's not so matter what you what we how much we have, we're not changing. Because stuff doesn't change us. We got Jesus inside of us. We got the Spirit of God inside of us. We know what to do. And we know how to watch ourselves. You know, we're not gonna we, we watch TV but we don't go crazy with it. Or anything else. You know, we do things in moderation. We you know, we don't have to get the lecture about eating. You know, we realize this. And everybody eats different, everybody drinks different, everybody else thinks different. We all know that because God made us all different. And I, you know, I can't live by your diet or you could live by mine. You know, it may help someone. They may ask you, you know, what are you doing? Well, you know, I've been taking vitamin C. Okay. Praise God. But I'm going to tell you something. It's the Lord, you know, in Jesus' name. No, not give the, the stuff the credit. Just give the Lord the credit. But maybe you have a friend or someone's choir. Say, listen, no, I've noticed you've lost some weight. So what, what have you been doing? And if you're led, you know, you can tell them, you know, or pray with them if they want you to agree with them that they lose weight but we always are giving God the credit that's just the way we are we always give God the credit you know and we all of us wish we th thank God more we don't take the credit for nothing no matter what we've been blessed with someone talks about you got new carpet in your house yeah I praise God for it my husband and I we stood for this and believed God for it and over a period of time the devil told me he's never going to get it and it all worked out I went to Home Depot and there was some carpet there and we ended up buying it had no idea he was going to buy it and some guy came in and installed him. And actually, actually had a woman helping him. Okay? Praise God for that. Father God, we pray in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. It's your will that we prosper in being good help. And I thank you, Lord, that each person, Lord, in the body of Christ is healthy and prosperous in the name of Jesus because it's your will. And they'll never get talked out of it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have you received Jesus Christ, your Lord? The most important thing you, can, you and I can ever do is receive Jesus. Nothing's more important. Nothing's greater will ever accomplish more than receive Jesus Christ, Lord. Why is this so important? Because it guarantees us when we ask Jesus in our heart, that we'll never go to hell. And we won't miss the rapture. We won't get left behind. And that God will come and dwell in us. That's how important it is. You do it once, you got it over for eternity. So let's do this now. If you're not too sure, or if you're definitely, you know, know you haven't done it, let's do it tonight. And then every day will be different after that because you did it. You receive Jesus Christ. I'm going to read the three scripture from Romans that tells us how to do this. And by doing it, you receive Jesus Christ as Lord. Now the Bible says here in Romans chapter 10. Now after I read these prayer, after I read these scriptures, I want you to pray with me to receive Jesus in your heart. The Bible says here in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, verse 10, and verse 13, that if thou shalt confess thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in the heart God has raised the dead, thou shalt be saved. For at the heart man believes righteousness, and with the mouth of faith means salvation. For whosoever calls on me, Lord, shall be saved. So let's call upon him now. And let's receive Jesus Christ as our Lord. Say these words with me and mean it. Say it loud enough that you can hear yourself say it. And you'll receive Jesus Christ as your Lord. God, I come to you tonight to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord. 
I confess in my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Lord. I believe Jesus crucified, took my sins and judgment to sin on the cross, died, was buried, and God, you raised him dead and he's alive today. Jesus, you're my Lord. I receive you today as my Savior and Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me from going and keeping me from going to hell. And I thank you, Father God, for that. And now you're my Father and Jesus, my Lord. To God be all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You said those words, face the part about Jesus being Lord. You said those words, that assures you that you've been right with God. You ever doubt it? Go back and read Romans chapter 10, verse 9, verse 10, and verse 13. And remind yourself, this is what I did tonight. I received Jesus Christ as my Lord. And I want you to encourage you, if you don't have a Bible, go buy one. You can get one online, and you can start reading the New Testament. And you can get a Bible app on your phone. Thank God you can read that too. And that's going to help you grow and develop spiritually. And, uh, you know, maybe you got a born-again friend has been talking about Jesus. Maybe you can start hanging around with them. They can tell you more about the Bible and take you, they can probably take you to their church. Well, that's going to be a great help, too. If you've got a prayer request, tonight at 7 o'clock, we have uh, our phone conference where people call in. They listen for a while, you know. It's not that long. And, uh, you know, tonight it ended up being three hours, you know. <laughs> but, no, yeah, and we have communion, so take advantage of that. And usually we take prayer requests. And that phone number and access code is on our Facebook page at Just Rich Ministries. Thank you so much for watching tonight. I'm so pleased that you do. You know how much it means to me. To me, it's I consider it a privilege and honor that you watch. I really do. Until next time, it's Brother Rich Mind. I love you. I'm praying for you. And remember, Jesus is always more than enough.